Lee, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. You're spreading the message that actually it's possible to create change. You've created a lot of positive change in your life, but also you're inspiring others to change as well. So I'm fascinated. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's always been the goal. The very beginning of my start of my platform back in 2020 was to inspire, you know, it was, tip, it was first to inspire change in, you know, the narcissistic person to go seek help. But then it kind of ballooned into what it is right now, a platform to help whoever is looking to change, whoever is looking to, you know, change up their relationship dynamics, change up their life, you know, just live a better life overall in general. What helped you be brave enough to say, I'm a diagnosed narcissist so publicly? Um, so for me, it's always the fact that even though, like I said, I, when I started my platform, I had already been in therapy for two and a half years, almost three years. But. I wasn't, I and mean, people close to me, I guess, knew that I was in therapy, like my wife and a couple other people, but it seemed like it was like a silent, you know, journey. Like, I felt like I was kind of healing in silence and suffering in silence, like nobody knew about it. And I felt like that was one of the issues. It became one of the issues in, you know, just in my life. It was like, nobody knows. I feel like I'm trying to get better, but I'm also having to, like, you know, restrain myself on who I really am and, you know, publicly and things of that nature. So I just feel like it's, it shouldn't be a bad thing to go to therapy. Yeah. You know, not, nece not necessarily the narcissist bar, but like therapy just overall in general shouldn't be a bad thing. Like go sit, sit down and talk to a therapist however um, you can, if that's possible for you, you know, if you're seeking change, because I don't think you can, you can make marginal changes by yourself. Like you can change your, you know, you can become more ambitious and change your financial well-being by yourself. But I feel like your emotional, mental well-being requires the help of somebody else like that, you know, help that, that can target what is actually the root cause of the issues and how you got here in the first place. It's There's so much stigma still around the word narcissist and what you're doing is actually challenging that stigma. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the goal is to challenge the stigma. But like if you is the stigma well deserved. Yeah, I tell people that. And it's like, you know the other narcissists out there or the self other self aware narcissists will push back and just like you're stigmatizing and the stigma is this. I'm like, what are y'all doing to show the stigma is different? Because there's a lot of people out there who are narcissists. They like being narcissistic because they like not being able to connect to people. They like, you know, they like doing what they do. And wow. when they find out about the narcissism, they, it becomes, now it becomes an excuse. It doesn't become a reason to change. It becomes an excuse to remain the same. It becomes, becomes an excuse to treat people the same way that you've been treating people. Well, now I have a reason to treat people this way. So yes, you know, it doesn't always manifest into a positive behavioral alteration. It sometimes manifests into just, you know, you die, you divulge more into the narcissism. You get worse. There's people like that all the time. Like even before therapy, I joined some self-aware narcissist Facebook groups and I'm still in those groups now, but I'm, I don't really talk a lot of those groups. I'm in those groups to kind of just see what's going on. What's going on? In my, I, re, I respond to stuff every once in a while, but I'm just seeing what's in the, in the mind of other people. I screenshot, I just, I screenshot things, not the post, but just to remind me of why I do what I do. Cause some people just like, they like getting away with stuff. They're like, ah, oh, cheating on my person, cheating on my partner. They didn't, didn't know, idiot. I'm like, that's not stigmatizing. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, but again, that's part of the process. So I think that's a really, a really good message because on my channel recently on YouTube, I started getting messages. I used to be of the belief that narcissists can't change and I've totally done a U-turn on that. But recently I've been getting a lot of messages where men have been, it can be women as well, but mostly it's men who've said, oh my God, I've recognized these signs and I'm, I'm so worried. I think this is me. You know, do you think there's hope for me? Do you think I can change? So I started encountering men who, mainly men, who have labeled themselves as narcissists who mm. want to be able to achieve change. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, I encounter those people all the time, but they, they'll say it. But I was like, what are you going to do about it? Like saying it, so self awareness is just part of the journey. You know, I tell people there's self-aware narcissists that are still horrible people that choose to be horrible people. Um, and they, like you just said a few minutes ago, they use their background and the root cause of the narcissism as an excuse to be bad. Like, hey, you know what? I can't control that I was abused in my childhood. So that's why I do what I do right now. I was like, okay, but you, you just say you, you understand that you're doing bad things now, but you can't, you, so you can't blame the childhood now. You know, you're aware of what you're doing right now. Like, and I just want to tell people survivors and, you know, survivors of narcissistic people and narcissistic, like, like the abusive behavior that you experienced was on the person that was abusing you. You can, sometimes you can't control that, especially in your childhood, but the healing is on you, you know, 
the healing part falls onto you. The work falls onto you. And it doesn't seem fair to a lot of people, but that's part of the dynamic that you have to face if you actually want to get better. It's not fair that you got neglected and abused as a child. It's absolutely horrendous, you know, that they happen to you. You don't get to pick your parents and whatnot. You don't get to choose. You know, I'm not pretty sure people are not just like, you know what? Give me those abusive parents right there. I want I want to I want to I want to crack at those. You know, you know, people don't choose to have abusive parents or neglectful parents, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's not fair. But when you grow up, as an adult, your behaviors are on you. You know, people can feel sorry for you. You end up on a documentary just like, oh, he had a bad childhood, but he took the lives of 40 people. People are gonna feel bad for you, but like, you still took the lives of 40 people. You still, so it still falls on you to want to make those behavioral alterations and to get better. I think empathy for narcissists has been something that I've noticed is extremely limited online. So I'd love to help people understand where narcissism comes from. So with that in mind, Lee, I'd love to find out about your upbringing and your childhood and hardship that you went through. My childhood was, you know, just neglectful, probably narcissistic father. You know, he just never emotionally validated who I was and what I wanted to do. So it's just like seeking that approval you never get causes you to, you know, sometimes retreat within yourself and whatnot and become guarded against the world and all the other good stuff. But in my therapy journey, it kind of helped me let go of that and to help me on my own personal growth journeys to understand why he is the way he is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't really talk to him. So, you know, I ended up going on Ancestry.com and find, finding his father's uh, death certificate and realizing that his father had killed himself when he was like seven, eight years old. I, I think my dad actually found him. So, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there's no therapy for a little, a little black boy to go to therapy. They send you to school in a couple of days. So you got to grow up with that and process that and you become emotionally stunted and traumatized yeah. as a child. So you grow up and... This is who you become. This is the result of it, you know? So they helped me um, understand why he is the way he is. And I felt like that kind of freed me a little bit from that hold that he had on me, being able to blame him and whatever. Yeah. Is, is he still responsible for his actions as an adult? Yeah, absolutely. But there's a reason why he is the way he is. So I've been just like, hey, it sucks that it happened to you, you know? But again, you're an adult now. You're 50, 60 years old now. So it's just like, are you still blaming that now it's just like you still have to take hold of it. And I know it sounds people hear that it was like Lee sounds so callous and cold. No, but I no, but that's that's part of it. I do feel like a lot of narcissists prey on empathy. They do. So when you give it to them, they take advantage of it. So you have to be direct. You have to be direct and just like okay, I can empathize with that right there. But you still gonna get held accountable for your behaviors. But that's what people are just like. Oh, I get it. Your your dad took his own life. I get it. And you feel sorry for me. You let him abuse you. You're like no, no, I get it but you can't hit me anymore. You know, you said you got to stop. There has to be something, you know, a stop gap right there or something like that to stop the behaviors. I know it sounds cold, but like I said, that's the only way I've learned how to communicate with narcissistic people. You have to be direct with them. You have to, you can show empathy, but like I said, empathy is kind of like blood in the water for a shark. They'll take advantage of it. They'll weaponize it against you. I feel like my little bit of lack of empathy I have actually helps me with deal with that situation. Cause I like, yeah, I get it. I understand it, but Still, I have trauma. I have neglect. I have abuse in my in my childhood, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, and I used to use that as an excuse for my behaviors. Now, but I can't use that excuse anymore. I know about it. So what I'm going to do about it. You know, I'm so. very curiously about your perspective of growing up in that neglectful, abusive environment. And you could have gone one way or the other. You could have gone into low self-esteem victim where you couldn't take control over your life and couldn't kind of achieve mastery because there's some mastery in narcissism that actually you come across as this like alpha figure you come across as very charismatic there is definitely benefits in you know mm -hmm. in, in some of those ways of being so i'm curious as to do you remember looking back on your childhood any kind of insight is what led you to develop the more narcissistic type of personality rather than the more like weak, obvious low self-esteem kind of borderline type of personality is like the other direction that people. So, so I feel like I have a combination of both. I do have low self-esteem. It might not seem like it because I, you know, I've covered it up well over the years. But yeah, okay. that's why I tell people. I just like, you know, I do have low self-esteem. It's just like it's part of it. I have a fragile ego. I'm like also her just like, no, my ego is so strong and I can't I can take criticism. Give it to me. No, I just still hurts my feelings, you know. Well, I just I'll ask you something. Sorry to interrupt you, Lee, but this is so interesting for me. If I started to like be very hard on you and I start to challenge your ego in this conversation and I like forced you to look at a mirror and like look at yourself and you know and I was quite tough on you with that how would you react to me if I was confronting in terms uh, of I, I match energy 
So I'll be, you know, yeah, I give back to you. Yeah. Whatever you, whatever <laughs> I perceive you're giving to me, I'll give it back to you. That's just my perception. You know, that's I'm just like, we cool, we cool, you know. But I typically try to I I, I maintain like control of my reactions because that's yeah, that's kind of a superpower. That's what you have to develop either way. If you're trying to survive a narcissist or you are a narcissist trying to survive, you have to maintain control over your reactions because if you don't, you lose. You know, you're giving your power to somebody else. That's yeah. really fascinating that like if I was being very confronting towards you and I knew how to challenge your ego, that you could give it back to me probably even stronger. So then you're challenging my ego and then you're kind of holding the status in the conversation yeah i just try to match people i don't i'm not trying to go above and beyond i'm just like hey we can let's chat you know <laughs> but it's, yeah, let's be chatty like why why, why the negative energy but like i, I saw so I, I mean i've had conversations like that before and people people do that and i just like i crack jokes this is the direction we're going in let's, let's go then you know it's intimidating for some people to like deal with that you know someone who's so capable of like being that sharp mm -hmm. in a social context so my mind is already is self defense anyway. So I'm already I'm already thinking about what if this goes left, you know. So my mind is already prepared just in case it goes that way anyway. So I'm not just like caught off guard if that happens. Like you said that. No, I'm already prepared. Just like what if what if this happens? What if it goes this way? My mind is already I've already thought about that, you know. Oh, so so hyper vigilant. Before I agree to talk to people, I gauge who they are. I'm just like what's where's the energy yet? <laughs> you know, where's yeah. the energy? Because I don't like I don't particularly care to have negative conversations. You know, it doesn't it doesn't to me it doesn't benefit anybody. I just like what where does that go? You know. Let's talk about women in your life and let's talk about really early on um, because I imagine my preconceived idea of you is that you probably would have been very attractive to certain types of women and that these women might have had low self-esteem themselves and may have chased you and like tried very hard to please you and there there may be some trauma bonding in the women that were attracting to you. Those are my assumptions. I mean I'm not even certain, you know, I just feel like I attract the plethora of different people from different backgrounds, high self-esteem, low self-esteem. And this will sound weird, but people with low self-esteem don't attract me. I don't attract, I don't like that. You know, I feel bad for people with low self-esteem because that's how I am. I understand what it's like to have low self-esteem. So if I feel people that are attracted to me that have it, I feel, I, I actually pity them, you know, it's just like, no, oh, that sucks to, to have to feel that way because I understand how you feel, you know, just within that space and that dynamic, I understand how, you feel to have low self-esteem it's more along the lines of like you know i'm, I'm very intuitive about energy and stuff like that you're you're kind of out there a little bit that's why i how to describe it like it's just like something about you just feels you know you, you're doing too much <laughs> that's what i was just like you're yeah. doing too much yeah that's why i just had my mind goes you're doing way too much right now your intuition seems incredibly amplified for people uh, it is it's extremely amplified and i think my therapist would say the same thing she was like from my very first therapy session to what we how we talk now is you know completely different from what she says you know she was like your self-awareness is insane now because you know like I, I study me and i study people as well but also you know i do uh, coaching and things like that over zoom i've talked to thousands of people over the last few years so i have so many different perspectives of, of different people i've talked to in different spaces and different relationship dynamics and whatnot so i understand so much more now and that's what i tell people when i'm talking to people like you probably heard it all like no i haven't heard it i haven't heard it all but i've heard i've heard a lot yeah. but i haven't heard it all i've heard some pretty horrible stories you know but i've heard some pretty you know I've seen some horrible stories go to some triumphant stories as well. So that's that's always a good thing, you know. Some of the worst stories I've heard have now they have happy endings now or happy it's not the end it's the, it's happier right now you know so i've seen that transition this is cool i want to learn about your journey in relation to past relationships when you were very young and then and then how your relationships are now and how it, how things have evolved because it sounds like you've evolved a lot as a person and been on a huge transformational journey yeah i mean just for me yeah i've been on a transformational journey for a long time just like growing up i had you know i i fit in i, I can fit into any any crowd like that's just me i've always been kind of chameleon like in this aspect of things to understand that different people like different things like if you're gonna be here you have to be this way you know if you're gonna be over here with this type of people person you have to be act this way you have to talk this way it just depends on who you're with and who you're around and it just like men women included it's just like whoever i'm around i just tend to not soak up the, all the energy in the room so tell me about your early romantic relationships maybe like there's some specific examples from when you were like teenage years i really i mean I, honestly i probably didn't really start i had girlfriends when i was younger but it wasn't anything like serious like that but high school relationships and things like that it was i feel like i would say it was normal ish relationships you know it wasn't until i saw i got on my own and actually started having serious romantic relationships when i started kind of seeing 
the dynamic of how things played out, you know, like every, like when I got older and had been, you know, had a bunch of relationship experience, it was just like all of them would. And that's kind of how my realization happened. Like all my relationships would end the same way. All of them would like all of them, you know, I've never broke up with anybody ever. You know, I tell people I've never, I've never broke up with somebody. I've always made them break up with me. It's always been like the reverse discard. If people talk about, it's always been my, mo my kind of my modus operandi to just make people break up. I just didn't want to deal with it. Just like, we're not, gonna be together anymore you know just to, to, anyone to deal with that you know <laughs> you would decide in your mind that you didn't want to be with someone it, in good dis distance and then they would have to break up with you yeah it'd be more like subconscious they wouldn't be like you know i'm actively thinking about it it'd be more of subconscious disconnect i, I just wouldn't be wouldn't care for the person anymore like i used to just like the lights would go off in the relationship so i was just like ah, i don't necessarily want to be with this person anymore and the same thing happened in my relationship with my wife it really did and i started treating her the same way i was just like ah, i'm bored now really it was just chronic boredom like you the person wasn't boring i would just get bored you know when i say that people are like i don't feel like i'm a boring right you're not a boring person i just get bored it's just like it's not you and what i tell people is it really is not sometimes it's not you you know a lot of times it's not you it's just that a lot of narcissists have that chronic boredom but they get they get so bored and just like okay i need something new or break up with them no. because you would then be the bad guy or that you would have to then deal with the the backlash yeah. the aftermath so a breakup you saying look you're a lovely person you're amazing but like this is just not for me yeah. and like giving them that certainty was not your thing no so that's not me still not me it's still not me on. i would do it now i would still do the same thing now i mean i'm, I'm so i'm more self-aware now i think i'm more apt to have that conversation now can i but, just get really clear on this dynamically because i'm so fascinated by it so you get bored and then you wouldn't want to say you wouldn't want to break up with them because that's conflict and that would be the more difficult thing for you to do mm -hmm. so you would let them kind of experience neglect uncertainty and they would be yeah. strung along for a period of time and then they would have no option but to be like what the hell is going on do you still want to be with me or do you not want to be with me like i'm gonna have to break up with you because this is just i feel so neglected and then the relationship would end when they would like you know sort of have a reaction to yeah, so, yeah most times it would go that way yeah it would be more along the lines of like it's instead of just having that conversation it'd be easier for me to just live my life separately from the person who's just not contact the person as much as i used to that wouldn't ghost them no no i wouldn't ghost them but i would just create this distance like by not being as you know not communicating as much not talking to you as much not texting you as much and you would feel it people can feel it you're like damn we don't it's nine o'clock i can hear from you all day you know so i've been busy i've had work today you know i had work i was sitting at home it's, it's easier to live my life without that person and not include that person in my daily activities it wouldn't bother you the amount of pain that you would be putting that person through in the process of you distancing yourself. I didn't see it as putting them through any kind of pain, you know, because most of most times I would just be thinking about what, what I had going on, you know. And I think this is what a lot of narcissists do. They don't think about what the other person experienced and they think about how does this serve me? Like, how am I feeling? It's always like an internal check as opposed to external, you know, internal temperature as yeah. opposed to external. So it's just you you checking yourself as opposed to checking somebody else. That's very well explained from your perspective that the way that your brain functions, the way that you function is look after number one, how are you feeling? What's right for you? What's in your best interest? For an empath, it's it's madness. Like for an empath, it's like, oh my God, how could you put someone through much, so much pain? And like, <laughs> like a complete outrage as to, you know, so I'm just curious about, you know, your, when people try and explain the empath's view of that situation of like, oh my God, that's torture for the other person. What do you make of that? So I've actually been on the other side of it. I've dated narcissistic women. So I've been on the other side of it as well. So that's why I, I can, you know, come from the, par the part of being broken up with like that too. Cause you know, I've had a woman do that to me. So I understand that part. That's when people tell me, I was like, I, I get that. I know, you know, I've been doing that. <laughs> I never felt that till this point to this, to this, uh. This is such an interesting topic, Lee, cause I know a lot of our viewers are gonna resonate so much with this experience from one side or the other. Could you explain to our viewers, why do you think narcissists do this behavior of not giving someone a clean breakup and not actually kind of having the courage or balls to go into those kind of conversations that would be considered perhaps more compassionate? Um, a lot of times is I would say, cowardice you don't want to do it because you're scared you know you don't want to face the consequences or deal with that person's reactions or whatever shame comes into play a lot just like you don't want to face the person and also a sidebar of it could be just like i can come back to you later on you know if i don't if i don't give you any type of finality then i could possibly you know spin back to you later on and whatnot 
to have this conversation like we can come back later on together in this aspect of things right there yeah so that makes perfect sense so there is like a quite an egocentric view or quite a self-centered view of like well maybe i won't be bored later on and i can just loop back more easily so i can put that on the on the side over there while i continue yeah. on with my life find more exciting partners and then when i get bored of my new partners I might not be bored of this. If this person leaves me alone yeah. for a while, it might become exciting again. So I understand that. What about the shame? Because you mentioned shame of having to have that conversation. You don't like have to face somebody and look at them in the face. And I mean, some people will. Some people will do it. You know, I'm just this. This is not my style. Some people would be cold and callous and break it with you. Look you directly in your eyes and just say, "This is not working for me," or just "You're not enough." Look at you. They'll try to break you. They'll try to leave you. They'll try to break you down and whatnot because it's easier to leave you broken than it is to not. You know, just like I need to leave this person broken to make sure I'm moving on to somebody better, you know, but in relation to breaking things as well, let's say it's a good way. It's a, for some people, it's the best way for them. They feel to get out of a relationship is to break everything. So then yeah. there's nothing to go back. There's, to. there's nothing to go back to. Yeah. So the, the other aspect of it, the shame, like you don't want to have to look in somebody's face and see them crying. You don't, you don't, you, just, you don't want to deal with their emotions. You know, just like, ah. I don't want to feel that because make me it might make me feel bad to do this, you know, just like you don't want to, to deal with that type of stuff right there and you know, to deal with that connection. Is this your daughter? Yes. Hi, what's her name? Adaya. Hey, baby. Hi, Adaya. Hi, Adaya. It looks nice. <laughs> nice to meet you, Adaya. Being a dad where you've grown up not necessarily having deep levels of empathy. It's been a journey to say the least, you know, it's been a very, very, very interesting journey of growth and, you know, connection and whatnot, learning kids overall in general, that they're little, little people, little personalities and things like that. So. It's a huge responsibility for you to take on, particularly with how you were brought up and the neglect and trauma that you experienced, and then having to perhaps learn things about yourself and, and yeah. your behaviors, your reactions impact your child. So I'm just curious about what did you learn on the journey? What were you initially not doing so well? And then later on, you were like, okay, if I do this different, it's going to serve my my child better. I'm just being able to just understand that they are people too, with their own personalities and own individuality. You know, they are humans and they have their own, they don't need to act just like me and live up to these goals I have for them. They have their own goals and whatnot and all the other good stuff. Because it just helps them. You know, it's not all about me. They can live their own lives. To, you know, oh, they're good people. I'd rather them be good people than anything else. So this feeds into the area of enmeshment where when people are more egocentric or have higher traits of narcissism, they can see their children as extensions of them. Or they can only see their children as extensions of them rather than having their own thoughts, feelings, and wanting to be very individual. I'm curious, how did you learn to start to think of your your children as being their own individuals who could make their own decisions and who could also be very different from you and that their their behavior doesn't necessarily reflect badly on you so that's still the, the behavior reflecting badly that's still an issue now um but i feel like therapy has helped out a lot you know i just feel like therapy overall has helped out tremendously to help understand it and take a deeper look at them you know they are little little dems not little me like little me's Tell me about that when you were struggling to like their behavior was maybe causing shame in your embarrassment. I'm curious about that times where you really wanted your children to be a version that would would be ideal for you. And then you having to learn that actually they can't always be that. I mean, it's like I said, their the bad behavior is reflecting badly on me is still that's still a thing now, even with all of I have three kids, you know, even with all of them in their different stages of life. When they act bad, it's like, oh, that's on me. You know, people go, people are going to, it's more along the lines of like shame. People are going to think they have a bad home life or they not raised correctly if they're acting bad or they're acting up. So it's always going to come back to me in some way, shape or form. So that's the mindset of it. You know, that's the thoughts. Like I said, just trying to help them navigate life the, to the best, you know, their lives are not my life. They don't, they're not growing up how I grew up, you know. Did you get to a point where you realized that if you hold those beliefs that their behavior is going to reflect so badly on you that it could lead you to then do behaviors that puts a lot of pressure on them or a lot of shame on them for not being perfect. Yeah, yeah it definitely crosses the mind all the time. So you just, you know, you try to parent in a way that's like not necessarily gentle parenting, but also, but you're coming from a place of like, connecting to them and listening to them and you know validating how they feel if they're crying and stuff like that if you know, don't, don't 
deal with the tears. I don't particularly like crying. Just like when your children cry, because you wouldn't have. Like, like, I, I just still don't like when they cry. It, yeah, it just it depends on why they're crying. You know, if they're crying for something, something I told them not to do, I, I get angry. You know, it's like literally, it's just like you know, I plan on the steps. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And I was like, yeah, immediately it goes to anger instead of like compassion. So, but. You know, just helping them, just guide them through life so they have better a better chance at life than, you know, I did. You know, even though I work at myself, I'm in a lot better place now. So don't have the same type of childhood wounds that I had and whatnot. Parent rage is like a normal thing for all parents. But when you do end up being angry and then you know that it was like too much or inappropriate or like it could hurt their feelings how do you deal with that in the in the aftermath i try to talk to them and apologize as soon as i can if i get angry at them you know because i would never would, ap would apologize i know that's what you get you know but now it's just like i apologize for saying that i shouldn't have raised my voice or whatever and i just expl explained to them why i got mad and how we can correct the behavior so it doesn't happen again so that's where I'm at right now, where as opposed to I just like, you know, I saw it. something really good that you wrote on your Instagram about apologies and you were like dissecting an apology the other day. I, I love I love I love doing it. I, I love it. I love it. I love dissecting apologies. So people just because people don't I think it wakes so many people up to the apologies that they the, the apologies that they've been receiving for years. It just wakes them up like, damn, they really were not sorry for what they did. Like, no, they wouldn't. They just, hey, sorry for everything. Hope we can hope we can move past it. Love you. What? So let's talk about that for the for the viewers. Let's talk about because apology and narcissism is like a very interesting area. So let's talk about when people might never get an apology, when people might get an apology that serves the narcissist well, and when they might get a genuine apology. So I've talked to so many people who haven't received an apology in years. Like I said, it's like, you know, when I post that I'm sorry for everything, it's not an apology. They was like, well, there's more than I've ever gotten. Even 20 years, I, I haven't heard sorry for anything. Because that, once they get away with things in the beginning, they don't feel like they need to apologize. So for if their behavior is accepted or tolerated, they don't need to apologize for it. You know, so if I cheat on you one time or I do something one time and you don't, and you take me back and I don't say sorry, and I keep doing the same thing over again, why would I say sorry now? It's now this is part of our relationship. You know, this is part of our lives. I'm not sorry for yelling and screaming at you. Why would I be? I've been yelling and screaming at you for 20 years. You haven't said anything about it. So now you, now it's a problem. You know, so you, if you haven't received an apology in the first, you know, if they do something wrong, that's why I tell you one of the red flags. If they are not apologetic for the bad things that they do in the beginning, they won't be. They're not going to pick that up out of nowhere throughout the relationship. They're not just going to start just like, I'm feeling great. You know, just like, I don't need to apologize today. You know, but I very rarely think that people will get an apology that is authentic from a narcissistic person. I just don't very rarely does that happen because an apology has to serve them in some way. You know, like I posted that one the one the other day, the woman said that the dude had been ignoring her for like three whole days, hadn't talked to her. She'd been texting him, calling him. He ain't talked to him in three days. And then he tried to make it seem like he was she was crazy when they first connect when they when he finally read it, reached out. I was like, I haven't been ignoring you. Like you're crazy, like you've been ignoring me, if anything. But then he sent that apology in the morning. I apologize for my my absence. I let my frustrations get the best of me. Hopefully we can move past this and you can forgive me. Have a great day. What? And people were just like, that was definitely an apology. I'm like, no, it wasn't. Like, what did he what did he do? What did he do wrong? What's it, what, what what are his frustrations? His absence? He'd been ignoring her. He just told her that she'd been ignoring him. A real true authentic authentic apology requires, you know, specificity. It just does. You have to tell me what you did wrong. Tell me what yeah. you did wrong. So many people avoid that, especially in text messages, because you don't want people to show, hey, I'm sorry for hitting you. You know, I'm sorry for lying to you. I'm sorry for cheating on you. You don't put it in text messages or email because you show it to people. There's a fear that you're going to be exposed. So I'm sorry for hurting you. That's what they'll put. You know, how did you hurt me? Did you eat, did you eat my last bag of Doritos and I was starving? You know, did you eat the, you, you know, my food was bad? Well, did you, how did you hurt me? Did you step on my toe? Like, did you close the door? How did you hurt me? It requires specificity. Tell me what you did wrong. Because if you cannot tell me what you did wrong, then you're not sorry. How? How does that make sense? You know, and it also requires remorse and, you know, a plan of action. How are we going to, how is this not going to happen again? You know, tell me about avoidance of conflict because that's what you're talking about here. To me, it sounds like huge avoidance of conflict. Yeah, because I don't want to deal with it. When, I, I would rather just not talk about it again because not talking about it is the solution. You know, you should like in the apology I just told you about. Hopefully, we can move past this. That's the end of the conversation. I don't want to talk about this no more because it's easy. It's kind of like having a the same very similar situation to having a breakup with you, looking in your face and break up with you. You don't want to do. You don't want to deal with the emotions that come along with that. You know. 
I'm already thinking it's going to be conflict. I might be yelling and screaming. I don't want to hear you crying. I don't want to see that. I want to deal with it. So just like, let's just move past this for, it's for the best. You know, and it leads to so many unresolved issues in toxic relationships. And that's why you will be having a good night in a couple of weeks if you do take them back. And then you'll bring it up because you're not, you're not over it. <laughs> you're just like, hey, maybe you were lying to me. You ignore me for those three days. So why did you do that? I thought we were past that. Why are you bringing it up now? You know, you see. What was it like for you to have to learn to have very difficult conversations with your romantic partners where you would have to listen to how your behavior impacted them and, you know, be patient and, and see things from their perspective in order to be able to sustain a connection? I mean, it's, it's still hard now. I still don't like hearing people talk about what I've done wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy those conversations even now. What was that experience like? If someone's saying something that wasn't like all, po I mean, I had some positives, but I had something yeah. that wasn't positive. I'm curious about how did that impact you? Like in terms of your emotions or in terms of your, I mean, the negative parts always stand out more to people. You know, it's just like you, it's kind of like the, the positive is a whisper, <laughs> you know, you're like, you talk very well, but you do this, you know, that's what, yeah, it's just how, yeah, but that's how it goes. I mean, that's part of it. And is it hard though for you to because of um, where your ego is at is it is it hard at times for you to you know, receive that information even if it's like presented in a very delicate and like this way so it used to be hard for me to do that because you know i always tell people if it's not praise it's criticism so if it's you know all criticism even constructive criticism is criticism it's in the word you know so if it's not praise it's criticism so there's a lot of people who take that take that as an insult what you just said you know a lot of narcissistic people they were hyper focused on it and they might try to come back at you just like well let me tell you about yourself you know so there's you know they speak about how you talk you know just like this how people you know they go on a defensive you know there's no need to get defensive right there. i don't feel like you were trying to disrespect me so it just back in the day it was just like you know i would take it as disrespect but now it was like it's not disrespect you know just like you know that's why i always ask myself the question like is it you know it's kind of like the the paranoia that kicks in like you're trying to hurt me right now like but no there's no no intent on hurting anybody right now so i'm curious about the journey of interpersonal romantic relationships and what where were you when you were at your worst and where were you able to make um, some positive changes so at my worst i would just say I, don't know, I, I feel like I disconnect from people. Like, I feel like I so, super self, I get to a point where I, I super self isolate, you know, mm -hmm. and I would be super self destructive in my interpersonal relationships. Because, like you said, somebody would have gave me any kind of criticism or pushback on me in real life, I would just like, eh, I don't need this person around me anymore, you know. Okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't serve me to have this person in my life or in my circle anymore. Speaking with this right now, it just it doesn't because of this situation and whatnot. You know, that's how that's how I would normally view it. Um, self isolate is a very interesting term because I have visions of you like shutting yourself away in a room and not speaking to people for days or weeks. Oh, I do that. I'm doing it right now. That's why I'm one of my steps right now is to. It's literally one of my goals right now is to get back into like the real world because I've been so disconnected from people. You know, it seemed, it would seem like because I, what I'm doing right now, I would be out there in the public eye so much more. I would have more friends and stuff like that, which is true, but I, I, I really do super self isolate. I, I don't trust people. You know, I, it's like, it's hard for me to trust. Like, even when I'm like in my real life that I feel like they betray me and I don't, if I can't trust the people closest to me. It's just like, okay, let me be myself for a little while. To make sure my you know radar is back on correctly because like one of my last one of my good friends the last couple of years he uh, did some old crazy betrayal stuff to me and i had to cut him out of my life you know and wow i imagine that this would be hard for someone if they if their intention is to only care for you and like have a good interpersonal relationship and be there for you and like they are, they've got very pure intentions it must be incredibly difficult for those people if you distance yourself yeah, but a lot of the people I actually hang around are narcissistic people themselves, you know? So it's just kind of like you keep them close, but also at arm's length. Like I said, my last friend, he was like my business partner. What it does helping other people give you? I, I like helping other people. It's, I don't know. I really like seeing people win. That's my goal. You know, I really, I love it. You know, I really do. Because even my therapist, he was just like, what you do now is in service. You're providing a service to people that you feel like you didn't have growing up. So now you're helping so many people. Like my, I wrote a kid's book, you know, <laughs> for kids that are in, you know, damaged households and trauma and stuff like that. So that's, you know, my goal has been always to help people. I like helping people. Even before I started my YouTube stuff like that, I was helping people in real estate. I was helping people, you know, post inspirational quotes and help people lose weight and stuff like that. I, I always like helping people. That's like, you know, that's always kind of been my thing. 
when you're in a relationship and you can see that your partner needs certain things from you that don't actually make any sense to you because you're not necessarily highly empathic, but you know it's really important to your partner, do you ever make exceptions and you just provide the behaviors that your partner needs without really it making sense to you or without you really seeing the function or the point? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I do that now. I feel like it's kind of one of the things that, you know, on the healing journey, you do things that maybe you don't even like to do sometimes, you know, to make other people happy. Cause like I say, just to, you know, I like connecting to people and talking to people, especially like my wife and, and kids and things like that. But there's certain things that I don't particularly care to do. And then, you know, but like, like I said, those, those conversations, you know, but I have them anyway, cause it is, is healthy. It's better communication. It makes things last longer. I mean, it's better for my kids and it's also better for me. It just, you know, shows me and proves to myself that I'm moving in the right direction that I can do the things that people say narcissists can do when you were much younger and you were attracting certain because i imagine that we talked about low self-esteem women who may mm -hmm. come across very needy to you and like were maybe chasing you and like needs to be validated by you because they saw that you were perhaps you know someone that was maybe triggered their abandonment wounds triggered their fear of abandonment did you have kind of lots of anger like were women very angry at you at one point did you did you trigger women were certain did certain types of women kind of try and chase you and uh, you know kind of like develop sort of trauma bonds or upset obsessions towards you um, i feel like not necessarily when i was younger i feel like i do i go through more of that now why that you know and even my therapist in her last i had her she had to write a letter for me and she like she like during his engagement in therapy mr hammock has seen a decrease in his emotional dysregulation anxiety and depression symptoms as well as a growth in the wellness of his interpersonal relationship and the impact on his community you know, so additionally an improvement in his overall functioning executive and mental health is noticed so i've been i've been working you know that's quite big i mean it's hugely like regulating anxiety and managing depression what kind of things did you figure out that just help you manage those different it's gonna sound super simplistic but i take deep breaths you know i take deep breaths you know not like they're not like those deep inhales it's just like i breathe in my nose Hold it for a few seconds. This just kind of helps release any type of unnecessary anxiety. Like, it gives me time to ask myself the question: Like, is this person trying to hurt me or harm me? How does this benefit me? It, it just kind of gives me time to talk to myself, mm -hmm. you know, in order to guide myself in the right direction. So I'm not as reactive. You know, I can respond to people as opposed to react. And most narcissists are reactionary. They don't respond to you. They're reactionary They're on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And then what about a really difficult one? Shame. Because shame and narcissism are huge. And when people go into a shame spiral, that's where life can feel really tough. So I deal with shame. I, I deal with shame by acknowledging that it, it exists, you know, but I kind of personify shame through therapy. And shame is not this this big monster anymore. I used to call it the shame monster, but now it's just, it's, it's the person. It's like the, you know, it's the monster under the bed, you know, but you know, you, you kind of look under the bed and you see the red eyes. You're like, it's oh, red eyes, but it's like a squirrel instead of a big, big demon. That's how it is right now. It's not as big, you know, if we, if you know, shame is going to come regardless of what sometimes, sometimes if you do something or you don't do something, it's going to come regardless. But if you take the action that you want to take, shame, it, it helps minimize the shame as opposed to maximizing it. Because if you retreat away from it, like I used to, like, instead of just having conversations with people, I would retreat away and that makes shame grow. Shame grows. You know, wow, that's you really, know. that's very powerful that you yeah. lean into it rather than the alternative. Um, Lee, narcissists are notoriously known for not going to therapy and not being able to kind of take that step or not wanting to take that step. What do you think made you capable of being able to turn up and consistently go to therapy which it clearly has helped you a lot because like first it helps me a lot but, but for me like even before therapy i had already kind of been in the the realm of personal development i had already been working on myself for like 12 years before i haven't stepped a foot in the therapist's office so i was i was always always open to changing my mind on things to change my behavior i was always open to bettering myself so but you know Tony Robbins and Les Brown and Zig Ziglar, all of those, that's, that's for the, the masses. That's for a lot of people, right? Therapy for me is just personalized personal development. It's, you know, it's just like, it's personal development that's catered towards me. So just, you know, my therapist can't, 
the the plan that I'm on won't help somebody else because it's, it's my plan, you know. But that's what I tell people. People want to see my therapist. They're like, my therapist might not be the best fit for you, you know. I'm trying to help people, you know. I think she's like so again. I don't think she I actually thought it would get to this point. She diagnosed me with NPD. She's like, damn, you crazy. It's rare, it's rare people who've been actually diagnosed with narcissistic personality sort of turn up for therapy, with the exception of a common time that people with NPD do come to therapy is when a relationship is ending. And that's yeah. when they when they turn up. Um, Lee, I'm very curious as to what advice you would give other people who are identifying as having extremely high traits of narcissism or who have been diagnosed with MPD and there are areas of their life that they would love to see change in. The first thing I would just tell people, self-awareness is just step one. You know, it, it just like you have to once you become self-aware, you have to choose whether or not you want to be self-aware and take action to better yourself. Or do you want to be a self-aware victim? Because there's a lot of people out there who consider themselves self-aware narcissists, but they are just a different type of victim. They are kind of steeped in their victimhood. It's like, oh, I had a bad childhood. So like I was saying earlier, they use that becomes their um, the, their mantra to kind of word on it, put a badge on there like had a bad childhood narcissists you know and they were so you understand like hey this is why i'm treating you badly they always point to the badge you know i've taken a badge off i'm like i'm not a victim you know i'm just like you know i might have been a victim before but i'm no longer a victim of anybody i'm i'm in control you have to want to take control of your emotion you have to want to take control of who you are and where you're going in life you actually have to want to put the work in most people don't want to put the work in just being realistic most people don't want to most people like living their life the way they live it yeah because they're they're getting their needs met I always tell people, like, you might not, if you don't work on yourself, you might not end up alone, but you will end up lonely. You know, you'll be, you'll, you might have somebody that you live with, but they won't care for you. Like, you care for you. Like, they won't care for you. You'll be in, like, you have an old roommate and whatever. The work and is very hard. It is. You, you have to commit, you have to make a commitment to working on yourself and being better and being able to take a little bit of criticism and pushback because not everybody's trying to hurt you. I just feel like that's why I had to understand, like, everybody's out to get you. You know, so th is that something you had to learn? You had to learn to be able to take criticism in order to grow. Yeah, yeah. Just like not everybody, like I said, not everybody's out here trying to hurt you and get you and put you down. You know, mm -hmm. because that's what I've conditioned myself to. Like people are trying, people are here trying to get you. The paranoia kicks in, like they're trying to get me. You know, but that's part of the journey. That's you know part of the story. That's part of the tale of you know the tale of Lee Hemick. Just living. You know, like I just. I, to me, it's gonna sound stupid, but like to me, I always kind of just wanted. Once I got diagnosed, I've always just wanted to be the best narcissist, and it sounds silly to people. They're like, "Wait, that sounds you want to be the best demon?" I know, like, yeah. The, the, the diagnosed narcissist that helps people, you know. And how much did you delve into your childhood wounds and trauma in order to do therapy, or did you focus more on the here and now? Um, it's still a little bit of both. I feel like now, more now, we're focusing on childhood stuff. So I feel like it's kind of if I said therapy is a progressive thing, it's not just a one 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 stop shop. You like it's progressive. Like you, you kind of have to start with now anyway. You know where are you at? Who are you? It didn't work. Kind of work your way back. And so we I've been in there so long. Now we're working our way back. So it's, it's interesting. Lee, it's been so inspiring speaking to you. It's very rare that I get to speak to anyone who's so open about having that diagnostic label, but also inspiring others and and helping other people achieve change. Where can people find you? Um, I'm everywhere online. All social media is, is uh, at mental illness. Um, that's where the name came from. I was like, people are like, you have a mental illness. I'm like, no, but I'm trying to heal. So illness, I'm healing, healness, mental illness. It's not illness, you know? So, uh, so it's mental illness everywhere. I said, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube for longer videos. My longer videos are at everywhere. I might be coming to a city near you, but uh, I can also be, my website is mentalhealness.net. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you for lending me your time and sharing such insight. I think it's been really inspiring. And I think it's definitely a message that needs to get out there a lot more in this day and age is that mm -hmm. everyone can change. I really don't like the idea or the, the idea that some people believe in that narcissists can't change because uh, I've seen otherwise. I would say most narcissists don't want to change. They, because they're getting their needs met in some way, shape or form, you know, do you believe yeah. that any narcissist who wants to change can achieve change? Any, any. I've, so I've, as I say, I've met a, a met a bunch. I've been of all the narcissists that I've encountered that I would say are making positive behavior alterations. 
I probably can think of four or five right now out of probably a couple hundred I met. So it's just a very low percentage. But like I said, I'm not trying to say that to, if you're a narcissist listening to this, I'm not trying to say this to be like, oh, there's no hope. I'm like, you have to put the work in. Like, this is not a, you can't go to therapy once or twice and just be done. It, it, it doesn't work. Like, I've been in therapy for over six years, you know, and I'll be in therapy for the rest of my life. I'm and I'm fine with that. People are like, oh, that seemed like a long time. But it is. This the where the work is at. You know, that's where the work is done at. You know, you want to wow. have a happier life, you want to have a happier existence, go to therapy. Like, seriously, you have to make a commitment. You can't, I would say this, you can't do it on your own. If you want to have a shot, you can't do it on your own. If you have that thought process, like, I can do it on my own, I'm going to read books. Nah, you are part of that hundred or so people. I'll just say that I know that are self aware that that's, they will, you'll fall back into your victimhood because it's easy. Yeah. Your therapist hard on you. Are they very confronting and are they very direct? My therapist? Yeah. Oh yeah, but yeah, she is because that's how you ha again. That's why you can't talk. It should be nice. Like, look, this is why I think. No, you can't. You can't. I'm telling you, they will take. They will take advantage of your empathy because I would. So I'm just like, you <laughs> have to be. You have to be direct. You really do. It's like you have to talk to people direct. If you, you don't talk to them in the direct way, if you like, they will weapon, take take advantage of your empathy. They just will. That's just how it goes because it's, it's just a. It's natural. They might not even mean to. They just started doing it. 